Brother Darren is going to come read for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye came, come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating every one taketh before his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What have ye not houses to eat or to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say unto what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave, he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and show, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are cha chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the message that Ken spoke earlier. We thank you for your son, our offering to you before him. May we stand in him and be purified in glory. And we thank you for his precious and holy name. And we ask this through his precious and holy name. Our partaking of the Lord's table is not just a ritual that we observe tacking it on the end of worship. It's really a continuation of worship. And it's interesting to me in this portion that Brother Darren read for us in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 34, it's one of the clearest declarations of how it is we're to partake of the Lord's table, especially when you consider the congregation there in Corinth was fractured and divided. And even here, expressed itself in the abuse of the Lord's table, among other things that were wrong. It appears that there was a group of well-off 
Corinthians that would gather early. They met in homes and houses at that time, not in buildings like we do here. And they would begin partaking of a feast of which communion bread and wine were central, but around it other things, to the point that by the time everybody got there, some were drunk and others full. So you can imagine what this may have looked like. And that's why Paul here, and I would remind us that the Lord's table is about family. It's about community. It's about fellowship with the one we've come to remember, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And anything that takes away from his glory is not partaking of the Lord's table as God has instituted it. What does the Lord's table represent? Here you are, you've got the bread, and you've got the wine in your hand. Is this some kind of sacrament that if we eat this bread and drink this cup now, ah, got a little more of the grace of God in me? No. It's not the bread and it's not the wine, but it's who it represents. And that's where I want us to have our focus. Here Paul clearly said in verse 17 that when they gathered together, it's talking about gathering like we have right now for worship, it was not for the better but for the worse. Most people think, well, we're here for worship, and that's a good thing. We've got our Sunday go to meeting on. Not necessarily. That should give us a clue that just gathering is not necessarily worship. And here, there were two issues that Paul indicates when you come together, he said. It's not for better, but for worse. One was the disunity. I've been in congregations where there is a lot of disunity. And yet, once a month, we got to celebrate the Lord's table. So what do we do? Well, let's act like we're getting along. And we're going to partake. And then after it's all said and done, right back to fighting and arguing and complaining and bickering and gossiping. That's what Paul was talking about here. There was disunity. And they were not to act like all this just set aside, it's like a call for a peace treaty during a war for a certain time and then all of a sudden back at it. But also, I believe that there's an issue here of looking down the nose at the poor among them. There's, this is a problem not only of, of disunity but of rich and poor because in verse 22, he says, what, have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that what have not? There's nothing that disturbs me more than to have someone think that they're too poor to attend a place of worship like we have here. Worried about what clothes you're gonna wear. That doesn't matter. <laughs> Nor should we be of such that if someone walks in that isn't necessarily of our ilk or what we're accustomed to, that somehow we would think any less of them. I'll tell you, if the Lord's paid their sin debt, they're as precious in God's sight as anyone. In fact, those that think themselves better are actually worse for thinking it. So all of this is what was going on. And that's why it's important for us to consider what the body of Christ represents. It's a united body. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, rich or poor, but one in Christ. And that's why we have one bread. That's who it represents, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one blood shed for those that the Father gave to him. So. When we come together, yes, it's to remember the Lord's body. And that's what the unleavened bread represents, his sinless perfection. That's what was required for him to be the substitute. 
and his blood shed. And in both of these, the Lord took the bread and broke it and gave it to him and said, This do in remembrance of me. But what was happening here in the Corinthian congregation, and you stop and think about it, even in society, communion is pictured by sitting down to eat with somebody. Here we are all gathered here. I would pray that as we're about to sit down and eat together, that our eyes are on Christ alone. It's not how we're dressed or how we look or how we feel, but the focus being on the Lord Jesus Christ. So how is it that we should participate? When he says here, he that, in verse 29, he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, and notice, not discerning the Lord's body. I can remember early on always being afraid that if I partook of the Lord's table, but I had one little sin and I hadn't confessed that somehow lightning was going to come out and strike me. And so you spend a lot of time in fear. That's not what he's talking about here. Eating and drinking unworthily. To eat and drink unworthily is to eat and drink as if you are worthy and that someone else isn't. Looking down your nose at that other one. To do so, you eat and drink damnation to yourself. It says not discerning the Lord's body. Think about the Lord's body. It's made up of sinners of every tribe, nation, and tongue. So if you're, you're sitting here ready to participate, but you don't see yourself as a sinner worthy of the just condemnation of God, then you're eating and drinking unworthily. This is for sinners. And I can't tell you how many times over the years that there are some that have never partaken, even if we pass the bread in the cup because they don't consider themselves to be worthy enough. That's just the opposite. What are you waiting for? If Christ has paid your sin debt, that's your worthiness before God the Father. It's not anything and we are. It's who he is. In fact, Paul said, if righteousness came by law, or our keeping or observing of it, or fixing ourselves up with our little spiritual soap before we partake, like I was in one meeting one time, and the, the leader said, let's all just bow our heads and get right with God before we continue. Really? You're going to bow your head for a, and have a minute of silence and think somehow that's going to make you right with God? <laughs> Foolish. There's only one way any have been made right with God. That's the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Represented here in this bread, represented here in this cup. His body and his blood shed. And as we look around, I think of everybody here. I'm thankful where the gospels preach. We don't have issues with disunity. <laughs> Trying to get people to be right, do right, walk right. Those kind of people are down the road. They're somewhere else. I always tell them, go find a place that will make you happy. If that's the kind of thing you want to do, scrutinizing everybody and trying to get them to live right and be right and do right. We're here for one reason. Sinners in need of Christ and his shed blood. And that's really what this is about. When we partake of the bread, it took a body to be prepared and sown in the ground and raised up and then cut off. And run through the mill like we saw with a fine flour. And then baked. Put in the oven. Baked. Under God's wrath. For what? For us now to be able to partake freely. And the blood shed. It's, Christ could have come and lived a perfect life. Had he not shed his blood, there would not have, not have been any salvation. It required his body and his blood. So as we partake, let's remember whose we are. And yes, remember that we are a family, a community, not one better than another, and that Christ is all. Gracious Father, I thank you for this time to be able to spend in your word and around your table and to consider
who Christ is, that we as a body are not divided, but as one before you, Christ having paid our sin debt. And so complete was that work that upon him finishing it and crying it is finished, you justified once for all every one for whom he paid the debt. What a family that we can sit here together now and eat this bread and drink this cup. In so doing, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes again, but also express this blessed fellowship that we enjoy in him. And we give you the praise and honor and glory in his precious name. Amen.